sharing that, um, I actually spoke on a Sunday morning. The title of that sermon was, What Does God Expect? So this morning we're going to talk about, What Does God Expect Now? And I, I want to explain right off the bat that that doesn't mean that God's changed his mind. Um, but we're talking about now. Uh, right now. So we, um, we're going to take a look this morning at that passage that, that Matt read to us this morning. Uh, that really speaks, I think, about the expectations that God has for us in our life. And I was really struggling with how, how to go about addressing this. And then recently, within about the last two weeks, a friend, a really good friend out of the blue, sent me a video of Scrat the Sabertooth Squirrel. And um, I'm sure you all know about Scrat the Sabertooth Squirrel. And I see blank faces. Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. How many of you saw the Ice Age movies? That's it? <laughs> so you have no idea what I mean by scrap the saber tooth squirrel. Well, <clears throat> this friend sent me a four minute video of scrap the saber tooth squirrel. And as I watched this video, I started to chuckle because it really, it really did uh, tend to bring some light to what it was that I want to say to you this morning. So, I'm about to take four minutes of your life right now and let you watch Scrat the Saber Tooth Squirrel. Hey. I, you know, I was just sitting there thinking all the visitors here today, and they're going to go home and say, see what they do in their church up there in Bracebridge. Scrat the Saber Tooth Squirrel. <clears throat> Before we go on, I just want to clarify, Ray, it's not real, it's a cartoon. Okay. <laughs> that, um, that story, why it kind of spoke to me and why I wanted to show it to you is that it, it really uh, seemed very similar to that experience that was told in Mark 10 in this morning's scripture reading. Uh, Scrap had really accumulated this, this vast wealth. He had more acorns than he knew what to do with. He couldn't get one more in there. And yet when things started to go bad, what was he doing? He's still trying to collect more. There's never enough. He's trying to collect more of it. He's falling, you know, if you do or I, to where a certain death, miles off a cliff, uh, and cartoons, nobody dies. But as you notice, as he's falling, what's he trying to do? He's trying to grab all those acorns, all that wealth, all those riches. If you're a squirrel, those are riches, right? And he's trying to, to grab those. So no matter how difficult things got, that still was what was important to him. He would risk his health and safety to keep that material wealth. Don't we do that ourselves sometimes? Try so desperately to keep what we've accumulated Really only to find out in the end this fact that it's all nothing. It all ends up as worthless and turns to dust. So we're going to take a look this morning at that passage again that uh, Max read to us. And uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with us or you can follow along on the screen. But we're going to look at that section from Mark 10. We're going to look, first of all, at verses 17 to 20. It says, And as he was setting out on his journey, the man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. So in that passage that Matt, Max read this morning, it's a very similar situation we see. The passage describes Jesus' encounter with a wealthy young man who despite all of his worldly material possessions realizes that there's a, there is something more. And he asked Jesus about eternal life. So obviously, he's heard about that before. 
Well, Jesus tells him that he must do certain things. And that, that's the important part here, is that you must do certain things. When, we re when he's really asking him, he's saying, Lord, <clears throat> I already love you. I, I, I keep your commandments. I do the things that I'm supposed to do. But he's saying, what, what more can I do? In other words, what, it, what more can we do to love him? And Christ's reply, when you look at it, it's really saying to him, you need to obey. It's about obedience. But obedience is action. It means taking actions. Jesus tells them there are certain things he must do. <clears throat> All of them involve taking action. And I think it can be summarized like this. First of all, love God. He says only God is good. Love God. Keep the commandments. Love your neighbor. All of those, if you look at them, though, they all involve action. The Bible tells us that faith without works is really not faith at all. Right? It's, it's action. There are things that involve doing. What that young man is really saying is, what more does he expect? Because the young man responds to Jesus by saying, Lord, I already do these things. I do them all. What more? And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And that's an important part there, because when he comes to us, the Bible tells us over and over that God loves us, despite the fact that in many ways to him we must appear to be almost unlovable at times. But the Bible tells us here that Christ loved him, and he said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then he says, and come, follow me. Here Jesus calls this young man in the same way he calls every one of us. And how many times have we heard in the Bible where Christ has said, come, follow me. And further, he says, to follow him, we need to be willing to give up everything. For this young man who had great wealth, he said, sell everything you have and give to the poor. He was called to give up everything. We need to be willing to give up everything. Young man's response, though, was this in Mark 10:22. So disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He wanted eternal life. He had obviously heard about it, but he did not want to pay the price that Jesus was asking of him. He could not give up that, the material possessions, that material wealth that he had accumulated in his life. And so the Bible tells us he went away sorrowful. Well, when we look at this passage... Jesus, I think, has given us a great challenge. And it's especially challenging for us, I believe. And when I say us, I mean all of us here. I mean all of us in this country. We live in one of the wealthiest countries in the world with one of the highest standards of living on the planet. We have material possessions that are far beyond anything our ancestors could envision. And we are rich in comparison to most places in the world beyond what many other people could even imagine. I can tell you where Phil and Andrew are going in Haiti, our poorest among us here would be looked on as being extremely wealthy. We've got many things that we've been given to us, and that presents a challenge to us. Jesus looked around and he said to the disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples, it says, were amazed. I think we could probably substitute other words in there for amazed. Uh, the one that jumps out at me is probably terrified. Yeah, okay. 
when you hear what God has said and what Jesus told the disciples, and I think that amazed is probably an understatement, but it says the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. That analogy that Jesus uses there has always bothered me somewhat. And um, I think that's where that, that terror comes from. Why would Jesus use this analogy? A camel passes through the eye of a needle. That's what he equates with how difficult it is for us to enter the kingdom of God. Well, quite honestly, folks, I don't think it's difficult for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. I think it's impossible, from my human perspective, getting a camel through the eye of a needle is beyond difficult. I cannot fathom it at all. Uh, you'll notice it says that's not the scale, and in fact the needle has been made taller than the camel. That camel's still not going to fit through that needle. Eye uh, that needle. It's enlarged to the point where it is taller than the camel, but still, there is absolutely no way that that camel is going to fit through there. Well, if that's the case, what hope do we have? What hope do we have? And that's why this statement by Jesus has always perplexed me. It just didn't seem to leave any hope. But a year ago, uh, I was at a conference down east and listening to a missionary who was talking about um, the, the tribe that he deals with in Papua New Guinea. And he, um, he was talking about cultural context and sometimes how we need to hear things in the context in which they are, they are said. For instance, he said in Papua New Guinea, people keep saying, boy, it must be really difficult to talk to people who've never even seen a white person before. Uh, and, and you're going to come and talk to them about the Bible and about Jesus and the gospel and about spirituality. That's got to be really tough for them to grasp those concepts. He said, no, it really isn't. Because you have to remember the context within which these people live and, and, and grow up. They deal with spirits in the spirit world all the time. They believe in mostly evil spirits that impact their lives. Talking to them about spiritual things he said it's relatively easy. They get it. They understand. And he said, in Jesus' time, when he talked about the eye of the needle, he said there's a different explanation for that. He said, that's not what Jesus really meant. And if you were Jewish in those days, you would understand that. But when Jesus said this, the Jews would know exactly what he meant. He said that in the time of Jesus in Jerusalem, at nightfall, that all the gates would be locked, the doors would be locked, and the gates to the city. And so it was very important for the traders and the, the merchants of the day to arrive before nightfall, because if you didn't, the gates were closed, and if you were outside those walls at night, you were in pretty grave danger. Uh, there were a lot of thieves, a lot of robbers, a lot of criminals. You were most likely to be set upon, robbed, probably seriously hurt. He said, but in Jerusalem in those days, there was another gate, a smaller gate, and the gate was called the Eye of the Needle, and it was a smaller gate. So if you arrived and, and the gates were closed and you could get to that gate, it was very difficult to get a camel through that. He said that what they would have to do is they would have to take all the goods off, all the, the the, uh, their wares, they would have to take off the saddles, they would have to get the camel to kneel down and literally crawl through that gate. Very difficult, but doable. And I started to research this and I found there are many depictions of that gate in Jerusalem. It's one problem. Problem is it's not true. I cannot find any historical Proof, any historical data that ever says there was a gate called the Eye of the Needle in Jerusalem. 
it would appear to me that it is a myth that has been propagated over the years to help explain and make this a little more palatable, what Jesus said. But there was no gate called the eye of the needle. Which leaves us with this. Jesus meant exactly what he said. Jesus said, pretty difficult to get a camel through the eye of the needle. It's not going to happen. So where does that leave us? If that's the challenge, where does it leave us? Well, it may leave us depressed, but I hope not. We cannot meet the challenge on our own. But let's look as we go further in this passage. It says, They were exceedingly astonished, and they said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. The reality is, folks, if God wants to fit a camel through the eye of a needle, God can do that. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. But there is something that God requires of us. God calls us. God speaks to us in many different ways. For the rich young man, he was asked to sell all that he had and give it to the poor. And then follow Jesus. He's asking us to do the same thing. Now, it might not be worldly wealth that he's asking you to give up. But he is asking us to give up, each of us, to give up whatever it is that we put ahead of God. Whatever it is that we hang on to. Whatever it is we latch on to make sure that we're not taking any risks, that we're comfortable, that we stay in our comfort zone. When God calls, we are to respond. We are to respond to whatever that call is and be willing to give up whatever we need to, to put God first. It may be worldly wealth. It may be it may be television. It may be just to get out of our comfort zone. It may be to give up our fears to take that step forward. But we are to respond. God's an act of God. You're all saying, well, you know, I didn't hear a voice. There's no loud voice that called me to do something. I, I would say this to you, that maybe there is a voice and you didn't hear it. Because God speaks to us in different ways. You may not be called to, by God to travel to some foreign land as Phil and Angela are doing. You might not be called to go and minister to some, uh, some isolated tribe somewhere in the world. You may not be called to go into full-time ministry. You might be called for uh, what you may be called a smaller capacity in your church or in your community. But that small capacity is not small to God if God has asked you to do that. I want to ask you this. How many times have you had an opportunity to serve God by serving other people? And you've declined. And you've declined because it was too expensive. Maybe not too expensive in financial terms, but it might mean that you have to give up something that's dear to you. There might be something that right now is standing between you and God, and God's not coming first. It's got to be. There might be something else out there that puts you outside your comfort zone, and you're being asked to give it up. You may say, "Well, I really haven't heard the call." Well. I can tell you that there are times where uh, people may be asked to serve 
here in, in something that may be a minor capacity, or we may think of it as a minor capacity, although in the bigger whole it's very important. And say, no, no, that's not my thing. I really don't feel like you know, I'm being led to do that. Uh, I'd be uncomfortable doing that. I'm not talking about asking you to come up and sing a solo up here. But it may be something to, in your church that helps make this place run. It may be something in your community that meets a need for people out there who have very real needs. And we have been called as a church family to go to those people. We've been called to impact our community for God. We've been called to show Christ to our community. And it may put us outside our comfort zone. Well, if you didn't hear a voice, how does God call us? God calls us in a hundred different ways. And I'm not going to go into a hundred different ways. But God's an inv he's inviting. He invites us. He directs us. He guides us. Proposes things to us suggests things to us. It may be through the reading of his word. It may be through another person. Maybe someone else has really felt God talking to them about you. And here's someone who can meet a need. Our response to God occurs now. Remember when we started this, I said, what does God expect now? I don't mean now as opposed to then. He used to expect one thing, but now it's different. So I'm talking about, I'm talking about now in terms of time. Our response to God occurs now. God is working in our lives now. And we are to respond now. You, you've heard me pray in this church many times that we as members of this church family, of his church family, we have opportunities, we've prayed for opportunities to serve others, to demonstrate God's love to our community. And the other thing that you've also heard us pray for is that we do not miss those opportunities because we do that and it's, it's tough. But we don't, when we miss those opportunities, we don't know what else we've missed. We don't know what the fallout from that is. And it can be simply missed an opportunity to witness to somebody who's right in front of you. There, there have been times where I've had people sitting in my office and we've had a great chat and they've left. And they've left after and I'm like, I missed it. I had an opportunity and I missed it. And the problem with that, when we don't respond to God's call now, when that opportunity is lost, we don't know what that means in the long term. We don't know when that opportunity or if that opportunity will be there again. We don't know what the impact may be because we missed that opportunity to share with that person right in front of us. I think too often Christians sense God calling them to do something to help people in need and yet we fail to take action and we fail to take action because we're afraid that we won't be able to handle the task that God has given to us, that opportunity is given to us. But whenever God calls people to do something, he empowers us to do it. He will always empower us to do it. But unfortunately, we often have what I refer to as the unworthy objection. We object. We've got a reason why, and usually it's, well, we, you know, that's not my thing. I really wouldn't be comfortable doing that. Uh, I haven't done that before, so, you know, maybe it's not something that I should be doing. I'd say this to you. You need to trust Jesus in this way. When we look back through the, the Bible, there are lots of the old prophets that had those same thoughts. So we're, we're not alone. It's not unusual to have those thoughts that, you know, I, I'm unworthy. Um, Moses told the Lord to please get somebody else because he didn't speak well. Uh, Jeremiah thought he was too young. Isaiah referred to himself as a man of unclean lips. And Jonah when the Lord asked him to go to Nineveh, he got on a boat going in the opposite direction. The 
quote, un, uh, to quote Dr. Phil, how that work out for me? We, we find those unworthy objections. When Jesus called the disciples in Luke 5, it says, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Depart from me, I'm a sinful man, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. You'll remember uh, what had happened, and we'll look at the passage in just a second, but you'll, you'll remember when Jesus came along there, he asked, he saw uh, Simon, and he asked him to please, uh, could he take his boat out a little bit and take Jesus in the boat so he could talk to the people. And then he asked him, he said, would you throw your nets over the side? And, Lord, we've been fishing all night. We've got nothing, there's no fish here, but... You know, if you're asking us to do this, we'll throw the net over the side. They had so much fish in it, they almost sank the boat. Because okay. he responded to God. If God asks, he will give you the grace to do something. To all of, his ex all of our excuses, his answer is that he will be with you. Over and over again, he has said, I'll be with you. Go. I'll go with you. I like this quote from Rick Warren. If God only used perfect people, nothing would get done. God will use anybody if you're available. <coughs> We've talked before in here that we have to be the hands and feet, the arms, the legs, the eyes, the, the, the voice of God to our community. We've got to show Jesus Christ to our community. We need to do that. And if you're willing to make yourself available, God will go with us. God will show us how. Because Jesus ignores our objections. Ignores our objections and expects us to respond to his call. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken, and so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, for now you will be catching men. You've got to remember that he's talking to a fisherman. He's talking to a fisherman, he's saying, Leave everything, follow me. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. You are going to you are going to bring people to God. That's going to be a bit of a shock for somebody who their whole life has been fishing. These were not wealthy guys. They were not what I would call destitute for those times. But they were not, they certainly were not wealthy. They managed a subsistence living fishing. But they were called to give up the only life they knew. They left their source of livelihood, their families, their friends. They assumed a life where they knew they were likely to be scoffed at. They were likely to be ridiculed, perhaps even persecuted, perhaps martyred. But they responded. The correct response. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So in this particular case, Jesus didn't say, get rid of all your worldly wealth. They didn't have a whole lot of wealth. Go get rid of your wealth and give everything you have to the poor. But he did ask them to give up what they did have to follow him. And they responded. Jesus also uh, surrounded himself with sinners. And why I think that's important? Because that's what we are. We are sinners saved by grace. Jesus was often criticized for the fact that he surrounded himself with sinners. In this passage is when he first meets Matthew, Levi, who became Matthew. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, 
follow me. And he rose and followed him. It goes on to say, and as he reclined at table in his house, and that's a Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. He came to call sinners which we all are. And he did so, expecting a response. We need to remember when we find it difficult to answer God's call, that we are loved by a God who loves without limit. And he has promised us that whatever he calls us to do, whatever it is, he has promised that he will go with us. He's not sending us out alone to do something we've never done. But he will go with us. And he will go with us always. The Bible says even to the end of the age. So if God asks, he will give you the grace to do something. To all excuses, his answer is, he will be with you. We are loved by a God who loves without limit. We love him in return. And we are to respond to his call. Well, God's response. God can fit that camel through the eye of the needle. It seems impossible to us. It is impossible to man. It's not impossible to God. He can fit that camel through the eye of the needle. What he wants, though, is that when God, when God calls, that we respond. So then Peter spoke up. We have left everything follow you. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or fields or children for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields. He also says, along with persecution, we are going to be persecuted, folks. We've known that all along. We're going to be persecuted for our beliefs and for responding to that call. God never promised us a smooth journey or a smooth flight, but he did promise us a safe landing. He said, in the age to come, eternal life. For the rich young man, it was to sell all that he had and give it away and follow Jesus. He's asking us to do the same thing, to follow him. He may or may not be asking you, as we said earlier, to give up your worldly wealth, but he is asking you to give up whatever it is that we put ahead of God in our lives and then to follow him. When God calls, we are to respond. Amen.